Hello and welcome to another episode of Second Gen's Liberated Panda. My name is Victor Chen, and we are going to talk about the experience of being black in China with Titi, a scholar from the Black China Caucus organization. Titi is an open source intelligence analyst at the U.S. Department of State with expertise in international affairs and political analysis. Thank you for joining us today, Titi. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate it, Victor. Um, I hope the introduction was all right, but um, I will start. That was off by, <laughs> I will start off by asking you to briefly introduce yourself and the Black China Caucus to our audience. Sure. So uh, for me, my name is Titi Ogundele. Uh, Victor did a pretty good job with introducing me. Um, in regards to uh, my work with the Black China Caucus, I am their social media coordinator, and um, our you know mission is really to amplify Black voices in the China space. Uh, I think it's really important to uh, spotlight this niche you know community and really let it be known that we are very active in the space. And I think it would help with. Uh, a lot of what we will be talking about today, uh, kind of getting a little bit more, uh, I guess the word would be maybe like educated on how, you know, black people are in the China space, culturally, politically, and you know, everything in between. All right, that is fascinating. So how did you get interested in the organization and the field of US-China relations and foreign affairs in the first place? Sure, um, so I'm actually the daughter of immigrants. My father is from Nigeria. Actually, both my parents from Nigeria. And, uh, you know, I've always had an international focus just in general, um, just because of that. What really got me into the China space was actually living in Taiwan. Uh, my father works for uh, a company called Corning Incorporated. So we went over there. And, you know, from there, I got, you know, exposed to the language, the culture, and things like that, learning about Taiwan's relationship with mainland China. Um, and, you know, after doing Mali United Nations as kind of an extracurricular, I really got into uh, China and what was going on. So fast forward, you know, I go to uh, undergrad. I study abroad uh, in uh, Chengdu in uh, Sichuan University or Sichuan Dashui, as some will know it better as. And, uh, you know, just doing more language work, really trying to understand the U.S.-China relationship, China and Africa, you know, being African myself. And, you know, it's been kind of the, the rest is history, I, if you will. Uh, so um, I'm here. And then in regards to BCC, you know, just realizing there was more people like me. I was like, oh, wow, there's a lot more people in the Chinese space than I realized in, in, in various ways. And uh, what better way of kind of continuing that and encouraging more Black people to get into the Chinese space? I think it's really important, that relationship, uh, to continue fostering that through people just getting into the space. That's fascinating. So like I said before, um, could you please just um, give us a really short introduction in Chinese just to show off to the audience how, you know, like how the, um, reminiscing you of the time you spent in Taiwan and China? So. Yeah, sure. It's a little rusty, but, uh, you know, where do I start? Uh, well, the England means uh, TT. Uh, um, I'm having a hard time. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like that it's was rusty, that was I know. I gotta, you know, what the Jungwen, what the Jungwen you like, you were so you be I need to really study. <laughs> that was that was great. That was perfect. Um, <laughs> well, so um, diving into our first question, I would yeah. like to kick it off with a question relating to Black people in the city of Guangzhou. Um, you know, sure. since the internationalization in the 1990s, there have been many African traders and business people that moved to the Guangzhou area. Hence, right. a younger generation of biracial children was born as a result of an Afro-Chinese marriage boom. Some Chinese netizens are drawing the parallel between the black immigration in Guangzhou and in France, especially Paris. And, you know, the aggressive, offensive netizens are considering it an invasion. So what right. is your opinion on this? Um, you know, it's a common fear, right? You have almost like this invader into a society that you don't really understand why they're coming and things like that. Um, we, we have the same issue here in the United States, right? Like 
we feel that way about the, you know, Mexican uh, U.S. border. We have that same idea, you know, so the xenophobic kind of thing. So this isn't foreign to China. You know what I mean? Like this is happening in every like you like you mentioned, like in France, things like that. I mean, with people coming from the Mediterranean areas and stuff. So this isn't new, um, unfortunately, you know, um, in my head, it's almost like. Almost to be expected um, simply because. You know, you're in a situation where you have more or less a homogenous society, and now you kind of have something that you don't really know much about. Um, obviously, the way that you know black people are portrayed doesn't help. So when you see like this, you know, mixing, like people think it's like tainting, right? I think it's like tainting the purity of of a race, which is unfortunate. But it's a theme we've seen over and over again. And I think, you know, for me, because we have seen this scene over again, I mean, like the you know one of the big examples being the Holocaust. It's there's so much that we should learn from those experiences, to understand that this mixing of cultures is not a, a bad thing um, and how to get that message driven home in Guangzhou, especially uh, is, is I think it would be important to everyone's benefit that we understand this isn't a bad thing of merging, if you will. Um, I completely understand that. Um, there's also this conversation. Um, I mean, I would say contradiction. Um, diversity that a country is trying to promote, but then on the other hand, they are trying to, well, you know, like like people say, like remain their own blood um, in that way. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to this contradiction between um, the diversity that people are striving for and the exclusion, you know, people from different places are facing, um, how should, if there has to be something perfect solution to this, um, what do you think should be happening? I think there should be more, uh, you know, cross-cultural exchanges. I mean, we do that now, you know, we have exchange programs, we have, you know, international students studying abroad, getting more exposure. I think, you know, the issue with racism, right? It's a combination of ignorance, fear, and hate, right? A lot of the time it's taught, it's a generational thing. Um, you know, you, you don't just get born being racist. So I think it's it really comes down to the education and really understanding that, you know, a firsthand experience is much better than like hearsay or what you see on TV. I mean, it's, it happens with, with a lot of different groups, um, you know, be, being otherized and also what you're saying with contradictions, you know, of being more diverse, but deciding which groups you want to be diverse with, you know, it's like, that's not how that works. Um, and I think it's, it's really important to do more cult uh, cross cultural exchanges with, um, with groups that are kind of, what's the word, kind of known for being ostracized. Like if we're seeing there's a problem with this particular race or this particular ethnic group, maybe there should be some type of program around more cross-cultural exchanges. Like I think that would be the it thing because education is really what it comes down to. It's like you need a firsthand experience or of source so that you can kind of dispel what you've read, heard and, and seen like not firsthand. So I don't know if that's the perfect solution. We are already doing that now, but I think it's really, really important for that to happen. Um, and I think it's slowly happening, but of course, you know, as we saw with COVID and things like that, there still is a lot of otherizing, if you will. Um, so for my capstone project in college, right, I um, did this documentary film called Racism in China, where I interviewed two friends of mine, one of them is um, Jamaican, one of them is from um, South Africa. And um, basically he told me, um, the, the, the guy from South Africa, Bongani, he told me that when he was in China, he went to um, Bongshan, which is a famous mountain everybody goes to. And um, he knew that being black in China would be a huge thing, but then he never knew it would be um, exaggerated like that. So he was on the mountains and people were just genuinely interested in him. They would go up to him and be like, oh, is your skin real? Like, like, um, can I touch it? They wanted pictures with him. Um, and then he was like, you know, in the beginning, he got a kick off from it. He was like, wow, this is so interesting. I'm famous. But um, really, when that is something that's been happening every day, um, it got to a point where it is bringing anxiety instead of excitement for him. And um, moving on from there, um, although the Chinese government's announcement that addressed their zero tolerance on racism, discrimination against black people in China is aggravating. So what could be the reasons for anti-blackness in China and, you know, be it the discrimination on people with darker skin because it indicates agricultural work um, or the generalization of certain criminal behaviors of black people in China or 
The white supremacy as the result of China's hundred years of shame and foreign subjugation, or the lack of education, like you just said, on foreign history, and linguistic problems that stem from ambiguous translation. So there are just many, many reasons that we could go to. And when it comes to differentiating ignorance and racism, um, what's your take on that? And can there be the reason for anti-blackness in China where they are just so complicated and it's a multi-part question? Um, Victor, I think you might have answered your own question. It, it is very uh, multi-part. I mean, everything you said is exactly why that is, you know, um, getting a little existential, you know, human beings uh, learn from putting things in groups and kind of generalizing them to understand, you know, I mean, it's not a horrible thing, but the problem with that is a generalization, right? And so, for example, here in the United States, they, they call, you know, uh, a lot of East Asians, um, Asians in general, really model minorities, right? This, this blanketed term that this is how all, you know, Asians act, this is how all Chinese people act, which is not the case. You guys are not a, like Chinese people are not a monolith, right? Like they are also a, a vast like community. And so the problem with, you know, the reasons why racism spreads is because it's been generalized. If you see nothing but uh, things about gangs and violence and all you see is black skin, you're automatically going to be like, all right, when I see this person, that's they look like the person on the TV screen. Is that fair? No. But if you don't have the exposure and then you see it and then the first time you see it is like this, you know, black man on the mountain somewhere. You're going to be kind of like, whoa, you know, um, like we said, education, exposure is really, really important. Um, but it is, it, is a, it is a multi-pronged thing. You know, a government can say zero tolerance, but the government and the people are two different things, right? Like governments technically are supposed to represent the people, but how the people feel and how the government will feel will be very different. I mean, we have laws in the books here about uh, certain things that in reality aren't actually put into practice. So it's really actually, you know, if the government's saying that we have zero tolerance and you really need to enforce that enforcement is so key because it's, it's not fair, right? People want to go to China because there's opportunity, there's things going on and like you're discouraging that, but that's happening in a lot of different countries. There's, there's this huge wave of kind of nationalism of like getting the other out of here. And it's interesting because the other, the different people are actually what's going to make you thrive and grow. Um, I just wish that people knew that in the long term, it's much better for you to not hate over, you know, indiscriminate things. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 it's bad for everyone involved, I think, to have that kind of continue. Um, you know, I actually had that experience when I lived in Taiwan in 2006 of people coming, you know, I'm probably in a lot of people's Facebook profiles. I don't even know, you know, the pictures, the touching of the skin, all these things. And it was like, you know, my dad would say, they're just curious. And I was like, yes, but whether we are from different cultures with different languages, we know that's rude behavior. You wouldn't go up to someone and just start touching, like it's rude behavior. So it kind of gets to a point of, you kind of feel like a side, like a, like a, like a show, if you will. Um, when is this kind of recognizing like, Hey man, I'm just, we're the same, you know, different skin color, but you know, the same. Um, on the other hand, with, you know, like Africans and Black people in general going, or anyone going to any country, like, try to immerse yourself as well. Like, try to learn from them to learn their language, really try. Um, like, language barrier is a huge thing. I feel like there's so many, if it's a, it's a combination of, you know, people and their governments really working hand in hand to kind of limit this gap of racism that's happening. Absolutely. I agree with that. Um, like you were talking about, um, if all people see are just gangs and violence and in relation to black people, then that's what they're going to have like deep rooted in their mind. And that's not something we want to see. So speaking of generalization, um, the conversation reminds me of the recent tragedy of a female college student um, who, were, who was suspected to be murdered by a black teacher. And it just got me thinking that are the repetitive accusations on black people, mostly associated with non-consensual sex and drugs and all of that, is that a representation of the public anxiety or is this something that is actually happening? See, that's, see, mm, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, I'm trying to think, how exactly do I want to answer this? Um, you know, that, that, what happened to that student is absolutely horrible first and foremost you know uh condolences to her family you know i mean it, it's it's hard um it, it is really hard of that happening and of course 
it happening at the hands of, you know, a black person, it, it, it does feed into the sea. We told you, you know, like you let them in and they will do this stuff, which is so unfortunate um, that it's almost like, see, this is happening. It's an example of that. And that's not really the, that's not the case. You know, it's like, we have to have a little bit more nuance. Like this, this general, this generalization is not going to work. You have to have nuance and looking at that. Like it can be true. Yes. Like this person is capable, anyone's capable of anything. And so to look at the actions of one and let that be, let that penalize the whole community just isn't, it just isn't fair. Um, and you know, again, kind of like, how do we break that mold of people understanding that like we're individuals that are just different and we're not just all like representatives of our race. I think that's kind of the problem. Like black people are basically, re we represent our entire race whenever I'm just doing something singular, which isn't fair. I don't think other races really get that. Um, and, you know, kind of going back to your, your previous question about, you know, is it white supremacy? I, it can be. I mean, we've had, you know, right now the world is kind of made in the image of Western countries. So their culture, their ideas, they've permeated every culture, even if these cultures have maintained their own. I mean, the idea of blackness being bad, you know, like you said, darker skin means agricultural, you know, you have skin bleaching products and makeup. I mean, it's, it's really a thing of looking at blackness as like evil when it doesn't have to be like that. You know, there's so much history between, uh, black people in China just throughout history and, in the, and and even in the United States of like working together on many things like this isn't something that hasn't happened it's just how do we make more instances of that than what we are seeing you know yeah it's definitely um, something about exposure um just for me like use myself as an example um I spent my early life in China and then I did not realize that I was a minority until I came to the U.S. and I think it was really about how you perceive yourself in the world and then how you operate around the world like in the world that is around you so with that in mind how do you think we should differentiate between people disliking black residents and people disliking what they imagine about black residents mm. so are, do you mean uh kind of uh reality versus like kind of like the idea, like the idea of black person versus the reality of black people. Yeah, I think going back, like going back to it is pretty much just um, um, the stereotypes people have already that's developed in China. And then how are we going to penetrate that um, barrier that is already there that people, that filter people put on black people that are living in China that are just trading, that are just minding their own business. Right. Um. I mean, you know, like I said before, you know, you know, racism is taught. Um, however, that's taught through parents, this through the society. And I think it's just, you know, for me, you know, it's 2021. Uh, I think it's time for people to just, you know, give people a little bit more benefit of the doubt nowadays. I mean, there's images of black people doing horrible things on TV, but then there's also images of, you know, black people doing amazing things. Like it's it, the idea that we're either just one or the other isn't fair. And I think it's a matter of like one ask, someone asking themselves, like, how would you feel this was happening to you? You know, like, like you mm -hmm. said, like you didn't realize you're a minority. So you came here. I'm sure you probably, you probably have your own stories of how that went, you know, I mean, in every single way we all do. And, you know, closing that gap, I mean, it's it's a multi-pronged effort i mean it really a lot of it does also come with like why not just like getting education like through government programs but also educating yourself you know um the internet is a vast place to learn about these things there's so many books so much literature out there um you know even even right now with uh you know china being in africa which is you know a, a debatable issue in of itself you know we're seeing that there are levels of cooperation between you know between black people and china um it, this this idea that we can't you know um kind of coexist i guess you know it's like the the the, the fear of the other is is is, is really it's high in, in every country i mean ours too you know we just kind of had a mo we're still having kind of this movement of you know kind of keeping america a certain way um and i think that is for some reason that's being permeated everywhere i don't know if it's because of the leaders or just because there's just a backlash against foreigners. Like it, it happens, right? You have an issue, 
uh, every so often where the foreigners are to, to blame and things. So like, I know I'm going a little roundabout with the question, but it, it's, it's, it's such a hard thing to think about how to really solve that. I mean, besides just more, more exposure, like, and I don't know, you know, the best way of going about that between, you know, individual people wanting to, cause like, if you, if you want to learn about something, you're going to do it. If you don't, then you, then you won't. And so can we cure racism in China against black people? No, but we can definitely lessen it by, by showing more positive images of black people. I mean, that's a huge thing. That's not sports. You know what I mean? Like we're more than sports and all this other stuff. Like we're smart people, <laughs> just like everybody else. And those images need to be, needs to be shown. Um, and shown at a relatively young age too. Uh, so people understand like, oh, okay, they're achieving things just like we're achieving things. Like, it's not like this horrible thing, but it, you know, it's a part of me, it's hard for me to, obviously I can penalize racism, but the fact that, you know, my experience here in the US, my experience in China are very different uh, in terms of racism. I would say my experience in the US, much more active racism, uh, you know, a little more angrier and more a little violent. China was more passive, getting ignored, being avoided, things like that, or just simply just gawking, I guess. So that's the thing, my experience, obviously, I've never had these, I never felt afraid being in China or Taiwan or anywhere else. Um, But you can tell that like, you can tell they don't like you. Some people don't like you and things like that. So I don't know. I think it's just a lot of it is just exposure and just showing them more than what they're seeing right now, because a lot of it is just, it's just, it's a lot of it is just like, you see just like black suffering through gun violence, through police brutality. And we're more than, we're more than our tragedies. So I think we, it should be shown more that we're more than that. Yeah. Um, you were just talking about like um, being treated differently or like having different experience in the U S and then in China. So that sort of trans- transits to my next question. Um, people say that racism are different, like the ones in, the ones in the U.S. could be more murderous and the ones in China, they call it um, an explicit or subtle or whatever ways they call it. Do you think right. they could be different or are they just inherently all just racism that needs to be erased? Oh, it's all racism. <laughs> I mean, it's all racism for sure. I mean, it's like, you know, avoiding someone and pretending like they don't exist is almost just as bad as berating them for existing. Um, you know, like I just said, my level of safety was rel- was much higher in a country that I'm not even from, where the language I had to learn. Whereas, like I was born here, and it's like I knew very quickly that I was, you know, not necessarily welcome. Now, that's not to say that every person everywhere I went was racist to me, but I- I've had moments of it could could escalate to something more, um, you know, or I've been called the slurs and things like that. In China, not so much. Um, I think a lot of that is language barrier. Like even if, if they did say something to me, like at the time, I wouldn't have understood, right? Uh, while studying Chinese. Um, and it was a lot of avoidance. I don't know if it's because there's a fear though, too. Like they, like I, I have, I, I am not generally, but like, like, and, like people who are racist in China probably are, are still generally afraid of black people. Racists here in the United States are not afraid of us because the racists here have a history of having power. So it's a little bit different. Whereas if I'm coming into your country and I'm like this person, you're like, I'm going to pretend like you don't exist. Also, you might be a threat when that's not the case. I can be like the friendliest person and they just have this idea. Both are rooted in ignorance and fear. Um, irrational ignorance and fear. Um, I would say on the, on the American front, there's a lot more hate behind it. But obviously, as we saw, you know, with the evictions and things like that of Africans in China, like it can get violent. So it's, you know, I don't, I don't know. It's, 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 they're all the same to me. It's like, if you're treating someone like subhuman, then it doesn't really matter if it's passive or active, it's still racism. I would just say the style is just the only thing that's different. Um, but considering everything that happened during COVID, the style looks pretty, pretty similar, you know, <laughs> it looked very uh, on par with what's happening here. So. Yeah, I agree. Um, you were talking about people on the internet, and then that was something I was writing about in my uh, in my capstone project. That is, people on the internet just because of the language barrier and also this um, bad linguistic like translation problems. Um, I found people on the internet they um, they do this really bad thing where they 
refer to black people um, as the Chinese translation of the racial slur. So that is mm. in the utterance of the word, although it is in Chinese, it is also the utterance of the racial slur in itself. And um, right. I just find that really ignorant and disrespectful because people come from a background where they do not understand, they do not know the history of slavery that um, people have gone through. And the utterance of the word on the internet is really just disrespectful. And you know, with more people, um, with more black people in China, there are many of them that are just posting their daily cooking, their daily vlogs on, you know, um, basically Chinese YouTube or the websites there. And there are just people just just hating them for, for no reason. And then when right. it comes to these kind of people who generalize black people on the misbehavior of just the certain individuals and show their superiority, um, uh, just in a really disrespectful way. What do you think right. we could do um, on the internet? Um, should we have more people um, taking care of the common sections or what should right. we do? See, that's a really an interesting question because I'm also, you know, I go back and forth with centering and monitoring sometimes. Um, you know, because, you know, especially, I mean, like, Obviously, you know, it's, it's kind of like people should be able to be free to say certain things. Um, but hate speech, I feel like is something that should be uh, that should be monitored simply because hate speech can lead to incitement of violence. Um, and, you know, we have the same issue here, you know, uh, you know, people get very bold and crazy when they don't when they're when they're behind the keyboard, you know. Um, some people say things just for shock value. Some people say things just to um, just to be seen. Some people say things to actually be violent. And it's kind of hard to tell between the two. Um, you know, as as you know, like, you know, Twitter had banned uh, former President, you know, Trump. Um, I, while I don't agree with his politics, I found it like, oh, well, that, that's precedent for just being able to do that with any account. And that kind of got me worried a little bit, too, with just in general. It's like, well, who governs the Internet? You know, like who's who who is allowed to say what's OK and what's not? I mean, we obviously know like racist remarks and that are not OK. I think that should be something that's flagged, some sort of algorithm that's able to flag hate speech. Um, I think that's a good thing to develop. But like when it starts getting into like, oh, I just don't like how you said that or I don't like how you said it's, it's hard. Um, but racial slur is 100 um, percent things like that should, should be kind of monitored for sure. Um, but it's, it's hard. It's a hard, that's a hard thing. It's like, I'm basically saying if we want to start censoring things, like it's like, depending on the powers that be, they can censor all sorts of stuff. Like, you know, you censor someone from saying a racial slur today and you censor someone from protesting for something that is right. You know, it's like, it can be very slippery slope. So that, I'm sorry, that's not the best answer, but I mean, it, it's it's very difficult to kind of think about how would you monitor that because I mean we have the same we have the same issue here. I mean, people say a lot of crazy stuff, and it's like, well, they're not threatening, so we can't really flag that. But if they say they want to do something, then maybe we'll flag that. You know, it's it's like I guess just having that type of person kind of looking at it and kind of being nuanced with it. Um, but yeah, slippery slope, Victor. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a, a tricky thing because monitoring the internet and monitoring everybody that has account on the internet and then have their um, freedom of speech to some extent in different places. Um, right. It's just really hard. It's, it takes a communal effort to educate people and have them understood that there are things that you just can't say and then there are things that that you can say but in a really polite way, you know, like things like that. And um, Right, exactly. So, like we said, um, it's really just about exposure and education. So, I mean, at least for me, um, I'm having, I have hope uh, because I think, I, I believe in education. Um, I yes. believe in the emancipation that education could bring. So, I'm really looking forward to um, the more internationalized China uh, in about 50 years and how the people, the younger generation by then that who were ruling the nation, how they are going to think about these kind of things. But um, just on our way there, on our way of cruising toward 
a utopian kind of society where things are just better. Um, it also take, it takes the effort of the government, the citizens, and the netizens. And we just really need all of them to be working together. So, you know, like the government could be posing zero racism, zero tolerance for racism, but are they actually doing it? Um, the citizens are the ones with more in-person, close contact with um, people on a day-to-day -day life. And what could they do in their daily language and interaction? And just for the netizens, basically how they generally behave on the internet. So with all of those happening and then with all of those going towards, I think, a better place, um, what are you hoping for um, the future of black scholars studying China and the traders and businessmen there? Um, you know, Victor, just like you, like, I'm very optimistic. Um, and, you know, I don't know if we're too optimistic or not, but I'm optimistic because, you know, my, you know, my uh, being, you know, having my experience in Taiwan, uh, also living in China, you know, I, I do have hope because generally speaking, my experiences were very good. I have very good friends still talk to you, friends I've known for now for over 15 years. Um, you know, we talk about these issues all the time. You know what I mean? Like it, it's it's about the, having the conversation the same way we have issues here in the U.S. about, you know, uh, the, the white population uh, educating themselves, but also educating each other, you know, being an ally of helping a group, you know, achieve equality means, you know, looking at your own and saying, hey, you're a little racist. Here's how you should educate yourself, because a lot of times, you know, it's like crying wolf if, if the if the oppressed is saying I'm being oppressed the oppressor doesn't care but if someone who is not being oppressed is saying hey these people are being oppressed they actually might listen to that person unfortunately right like um but that's important it's like you know sticking up for yourself as a black person but also having allies and things like that and I feel like you know I have a lot of uh you know Chinese friends Taiwanese friends you know Hong Kongese friends like that uh who do that who understand that like this isn't okay like they and they talk to their own parents who might like act like that because a lot of it really is the older generation still educating the younger generation but i think because of the internet and because of more exchanges you know i haven't been to uh, china it's been 10 years so i know that you know i'm sure Chengdu has changed as a city i'm sure that there's more black scholars who have gone there and so more people have gotten exposed like it, it's i'm hopeful because these things are still happening like none of the stuff is discouraging black scholars and businessmen from still engaging with China. And it's not, nothing's discouraging Chinese people to also engage with us. So there's, I think there's a larger group of people who are like, you know, wanting to make this work than not. Um, it's just a matter of constantly pushing the narrative and, and doing that. So um, I think, like you said, it's, you know, medicines, government, and the citizens, I mean, it's, it's all of us. It literally is a collective thing. Like racism doesn't just disappear from one segment. It literally is a constant group community effort. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, like what we just talked about. It's a mutual understanding thing. Um, I don't have any more questions for today, but uh, before we head out, is there anything you want to say or? Um, no, honestly, this was this was great. You know, I, I think this is a conversation that can, needs to be had all the time. I mean, you know, what what you know what we can do together is so much more than what we can do apart um you know there's so much opportunity for growth there uh between you know the black community and china greater china as a whole and i just hope that we decide to do that then kind of regress you know um i think you know there's a lot of misconceptions on both sides and you know i think it's time to dispel them and learn from each other like genuinely care to learn i think that's how we're going to get through this and uh yeah, I think we're going to see a much more positive trajectory. I hope. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we we all hope that. And um, I do think that um, it's great that we're being optimistic about it. Um, so thank you so much for coming in and um, having this conversation with me today. And um, it was absolutely great. Um, thank and, you so much, Victor. <laughs> and for our audience, hope you guys enjoyed um, this week's episode. And um, Come back for us next week at the same time. Thank you.